I think we can talk about three major sources of vulnerability for girls and, and women. Um, one, child marriage. Uh, second, child labor. And third, uh, gender-based violence. These are forms of, of uh, vulnerability above and beyond that quiet violence that Amartya Sen uh, spoke of. Uh, uh, selective care f for uh, 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 boys, um, uh, selective care for adult men uh, over adult women, and, and uh, selective abortion. One of the key tools we have uh, for addressing all three areas of uh, uh, vulnerability is education. Getting girls into primary school and giving them the opportunity for secondary education is a major tool for dealing with these sources of, of vulnerability. So what we see in the reading for this week are different arguments for encouraging the education of girls um, and improving their retention rates in school, improving the performance of their teachers, and improving the rate at which families decide to, if you would like, invest in the girls, but by giving them the opportunity uh, to uh, attend school. Uh, education uh, also makes uh, a difference in regard to uh, the delay of, um, of uh, having children. One of the most important uh, sources of uh, discrimination against uh, women is, uh, uh, is marrying girls off at very young ages. According to uh, a UNICEF report uh, of 2012, by the time they turn 18, nearly half of the women are married and a quarter have given birth. And so one of the most important things that we can do to uh, improve the status of women is delaying marriage and delaying uh, the time at which they have their first child. That is, it allows for a dramatic improvement in their health and in their economic uh, status. What are the, some of the ways that um, uh, we know uh, work for uh, delaying uh, marriage um, uh, and, and decreasing fertility? So we sort of jumped into population, and I think like a lot of people, we were thinking of it in terms of, um, in terms of numbers, in terms of threats to our resources. Mm -hmm. And as we dug deeper into it, we realized that this was much more a women's story than a numbers story, it's sort of like Ken has realized. And, and, you know, given the resources, given the choices, women tend towards smaller families. And this was really revelatory for us from where we started, and we actually really wanted to have that revelation reflected in the arc of the film, which it, which it is. Um, and the other thing we really wanted to do was we wanted to hear from people themselves. And so we decided to tell this film almost exclusively through first-person stories okay. on the ground. And we knew that we were going to sacrifice some of the nuances of the issue, but we felt that like this is the way to engage people, this is the way to make them connect and to start a conversation. So, so one person we found particularly engaging and inspiring was this woman Gladys in Uganda, and I'm gonna share a let's, clip let's watch. of her. My name is Gladys Kalibala. I'm a journalist at Neo Vision Paper. I have a poem for lost and abandoned children. There are many every day. Some are just lost but many are abandoned. The baby was left abandoned in the clinic the following night. Mm. The mother had not come back. Mm. How is the situation of the child now? The child is still very sick. Uganda has the third highest growing rate in the world. Uh, fertility rate is quite high. The, the average woman gives birth way, to what? more than six children. Many women want to control their fertility, but access to services is quite difficult. How many women need it and how many get it? Uh, family planning, planning they're around uh, 26. 26%? Uh, yes, that's one in four. Uh, 
How old is the baby? One month and three days now. A year later, yes. she has given birth to a third born. It's not a healthy Mm. thing to do. Mm. Mm. What one for a year? Ten years. 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 Having fewer children should increase the chances of our children having a better life. In my work as a journalist, you go, you get a story, you publish it, and you look for another story. But I just find that I go beyond that. Th those children be become part of me. of people will think it's useless because even if you help one another one comes up but I don't think it is useless it's you and me. maybe if each of us was doing this we would reduce this percentage of people who are suffering You know, I, I'm sure you'll you'll agree. Don't don't you love storytellers? Don't you love people who are award winning? And I've been being up here with people who have been recognized for it. In the time that we've got, everyone at the Social Good Summit, in a lot of ways, is a storyteller. And there's clearly a story that's not being told. And you've told us about over 200 million women who want something that can't get it. That's the story that you've told us. In the time that we've got, would you teach us? Would you train us here? It's about issues that make people uncomfortable. Some people don't want to talk about it. You feel like maybe I can't talk about it unless I'm an expert on these issues. Give us a tip. Ken, give us a tip on how to tell this story so that people know about it. And Sandra, tell us how we can engage with people to talk about an issue that has been either hidden under the carpet, made into a taboo, or otherwise has just been ignored. You found it. How should we be as storytellers talking about it? Well, I think it'd be great if you joined me in asking, I mean, if women want it, why can't they, why can't they get it? Uh, this is, I just, I've just seen this in so many different countries and in so many different places. And, you know, I, I, it's just a good question. And there's a lot of talk about lack of political will and, and all sorts of high levels. But that only comes when there's a, a lot of voices saying, well, wait a minute. You know, why should, why should people have more children than they want? If they, if they want to, um, you know, plan their families, let them have it. So. Straightforward advice. Sandra, what do you think? How should we do this? <laughs> Well, I think that, you know, one thing I think you're getting at is, you know, why aren't people talking about this? And, you know, getting into it, when we come in, we're like, we're going to talk about population. And people are like, <gasps> don't talk about population. You know, like, you're going to be a population controller. You know, and one side says it one way, and one side says it, says it, says it the other way. And so you start to be like, ooh, like, I don't know if I want to touch this issue. And, and it's also, it's about sex. I mean... This is, you know, and, and it's also personal. Reproductive health is a personal thing. So I think that there are, you know, challenges in getting into it. But you just, like for me, it's you just get into it because it's important. And it, these are stories of women that need to be told. I mean, for, from my perspective, the way to tell it is, like, I'm a big character person. Our team is a big character person. And there's a lot of people out there who have amazing stories and finding that character getting people to connect to that character to that story i think is the way to get people um, engaged so we've heard from you that it's personal we've heard from you that it's not about data it's about women 
and that you said the word, she said the sex word. Did you hear it? <laughs> and I think people cause from it, they realize that's personal. Mm -hmm. But it's about an issue that matters. So it doesn't matter if we're, if we're men, if we're women, we're people. And I think the, the, the Beyond Seven Billion series, Ken, and the book that's coming out, uh, I, th I think we're interested to find out how we can learn about storytelling and what the stories are. Sandra, we look forward to, to seeing this film and, and, and learning more about how each of us has that voice and has that role to talk about it. I know that there's some people who are going to want to meet with you after to help tell those stories thank you for bringing these women's stories here and for bringing an issue that's not about uh, something that's far away, it's about something that's for all of us in a world of 7 billion plus people. So thanks to both of you. Thanks, Ken. Okay. Thanks, Sandra. Thank you. There have been lots of studies around the world uh, in this area. Uh, we have, and we've seen some of them in earlier work, weeks of this class. Um, uh, you, you know, you try to do better teacher training. You try to have better textbooks. Uh, you uh, uh, come up with avenues for keeping teachers uh, uh, in in the classroom for more hours per day, and lots of different uh, uh, ex experiments. You'll remember from our week on uh, global disease and global health. Uh, that um, deworming children was one of the most important ways of, of uh, uh, give, getting them better schooling. When kids weren't sick, uh, they were more likely um, to uh, pursue their studies. Uh, uh, you'll see in the reading for this week that um, uh, for girls, um, uh, the, 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 the the, there were there were all kinds of theories about how menstruation uh, affected their school attendance, and uh, there were people who speculated this is for because of cultural factors, and that girls were embarrassed to go to school uh, when they were menstruating, um, and they were coming up with different techniques for. Uh, 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 making them more comfortable uh, around others uh, when they were young and first experiencing menstruation. Um, but it, what they found when they rigorously tested these things uh, uh, with uh, randomized control trials uh, was that what really, ha the reason they weren't going to school is because they have cramps. It wasn't about social and cultural factors, it was about pain and they didn't want to go to school because they were, uh, were in pain. And so treating pain much more directly worked better than and other things in helping uh, adolescent girls uh, uh, have better attendance uh, at school. One of the th ways we found, um, uh, that social scientists have found, um, work best for improving education rates uh, for uh, girls and uh, young women um, is scholarships. Um, conditional cash transfers is what they're called, CCTs, paying families or pay, uh, to send their kid to school, giving a scholarship so they can go to school, investing with outside money in girls, improves attendance uh, dramatically. It provides an incentive, a cash incentive, uh, for um, uh, families to uh, uh, get their girls to stay in school and uh, uh, finish their education. It's very tangible, uh, and it also gives families then choices. Instead of giving them uh, uh, specific conditions that change, giving them cash actually allows them to make choices about what they're going to do with that money. And so con conditional cash transfers, it seems like a crude mechanism, just uh, uh, paying uh, somebody, uh, but it, um, it actually seems to be uh, more, effective, uh, more effective than some of the more uh, elaborate constructions. Scholarships work, and they work not only in um, improving literacy rates, which you'd expect, improving ability to deal with numbers, which you would expect, basic education skills, but uh, scholarships also are an effective way of delaying the first child. Because if a girl is in school, she's much less likely to be married uh, at, that, uh, at an early age and um, much li less likely to have uh, a baby while still a teenager. Scholarships have an effect on the age of marriage because the family now uh, um, is getting money through their daughter's education rather than uh, finding it in their interest to have her uh, uh, married and join another family. Another source of vulnerability that I mentioned uh, uh, before is child labor, which uh, often translates uh, as female servitude or female slavery. Um, and um, once again, scholarships, uh, cash uh, to the family, scholarships are a very effective way of reducing uh, young persons, uh, young girls, 
participation in the labor market. By giving the family cash for their daughter's school, they get paid if their girl goes to school, uh, that results in reduction in the likelihood that she will um, enter the labor market uh, while uh, still uh, a teenager. Um, and so uh, what social scientists are finding uh, in different parts of the world is that condi conditional cash transfers, uh, CCTs, uh, change the incentives in families in regard to girls. And that's what a lot of these um, randomized controlled trials, whether they're dealing with health issues, which we've seen before, or they're dealing with poverty issues, which we saw in a few weeks ago. Randomized controlled trials are interested in exploring what happens when you change the structure of incentives in families so that they will get direct uh, economic benefits uh, in new ways. How can that change behavior? And how can those changes in behavior become sustainable? In other words, you, you can't keep giving them money forever, uh, but do you change the way in which they look at, in this case, girls, because girls have become a mechanism through which they receive um, economic uh, benefits. We don't want to insist too strongly that education cures everything, but it does make a huge difference. Let me quote uh, Amartya Sen again from your reading for this week. There is a definitive empirical evidence that women's literacy and schooling cut down child mortality and work against the selective neglect of the health of girls. Um, education, uh, uh, literacy, and schooling are also the strongest influence among all relevant causal factors in cutting down fertility rates. That's why we have educate women, education, and social change this week, because education, especially education for girls, um, uh, has all of these uh, secondary and tertiary uh, benefits. Today I have the great honor of introducing a young woman who has been a tremendous source of inspiration for me and for so many others across the globe. A blogger and activist since age 11, Malala Yousafzai is now recognized worldwide as one of the most influential voices of our generation. Those of us familiar with the data behind international development programs know well that an educated girl can do exceptional things for her family, her community, and her country. Malala's story has brought this essential truth to the forefront of our global consciousness, and she has proved to all who tried to stand in her way that there is truly nothing stronger than girl power. Malala's courage and dedication has made her a hero, not just to girls, but to men and women of all ages. We are all privileged to stand alongside such a brilliant, compassionate, unstoppable leader in the fight for girls' education and women's empowerment. Let me introduce Malala's father, Zia, the CEO of the Malala, Malala Fund, Shiza Shahid, Elizabeth Gore, resident entrepreneur of the United Nations Foundation. And now I am proud and honored to present Ms. Malala Yousafzai. You have to buy six. Well, good afternoon, everyone. We are honored and excited to be with all of you. And most of all, it is my absolute pleasure to sit with a family who I've grown to adore, learn from, and love. Uh, not only these three, but um, your two brothers and your mom. And uh, let's just start out by saying it's been uh, 10 months since there was an incident that shocked the world. But you're doing amazing. So tell us what your hopes and dreams are for the future. When I see the support and the love of people, I forget about the incident. I don't... I don't think of, the, of, the, of that incident that I had faced 10 months ago, in which two other friends were also shot with me. But when I look at the smiles, when I look at the happiness of people, when I look at their support and their love, I think that I am the luckiest one. I'm, I am the most lucky girl. And 
It's such a great honor for me that today I'm here and you all supported me and you all stood up for me. It was such a great honor for me. So thank you so much. And my future planning is that I want education for every child. Children in Pakistan, children in India, children in Afghanistan, they're suffering from child labor. They're suffering from child trafficking. They're suffering from terrorism. And we need to stand up for them. We need to speak up for them. And we must do it now. We shall not wait for someone else. We shall not wait for the governments to do it. We shall do it by ourselves. It is our duty. Absolutely.